I will. Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, the latest installation of the uh, In Space, Space and Satellites Residencies. Um, so we're very happy that we can do exciting things at the moment, even though all of the buildings are closed. Um, and for anyone who hasn't seen the previous ones of these, uh, this is a series of residencies funded by um, the DDI program in Edinburgh and Edinburgh Futures Institute. And we're really exploring how uh, data and, si and society relate to each other. In this case, we're investigating um, data that comes from satellites. It's part of the Space and Satellites program. I had no idea before we did this that Scotland was one of the world leaders in uh, satellite technology and has interesting launch sites going on. So you learn lots of new things. Um, this is all being run through InSpace, which is a uh, center for kind of working across arts and sciences and looking at where these different approaches can help shed light on what's going on. Um, so it's a little bit art science, but we're very interested in places where arts and creative practices can change the way that scientists think about what they're doing. Um, and at the same time, ways that we can engage people around all of these uh, exciting developments that are going on. Uh, with most of these residencies, we've been interested in putting together kind of triads where we get artists lining up with scientists and also with technologists in the background to help um, produce high quality work in uh, these very technology driven areas. Uh, so, so far we've seen, um, we've had two work in progress sessions. Uh, we had one that was looking at uh, using comics to talk about how satellites make sense of the world and how they see the trees. Um, we had one that's uh, using dance and movement practice to look at um, atmospheric gas um, turning out in a, in a very uh, somewhat disturbing uh, discombobulation of body parts across beaches um, and uh, generative music. Uh, next week we have uh, Victoria Evans who's going to be looking at sonifying satellite choreography, so making sense of the way that satellites are moving through space using sound. And the week after that um, we'll have Stacey Hunter and Ben Hymers who are looking at using traditional crafting practices around rugs um, to physicalize data in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, but this week we're very lucky to have Elaine Ford and Connie Tremlett who are going to talk to us about, um, well, puffins and uh, ways that we can look at what it is that puffins do. Um, but before we go into those, I'll introduce them just before their talks, uh, but before we go into those, um, we've got Michael Rabatsos who's very kindly agreed to give us a bit of an introduction to the Bayes Centre and uh, the whole process of data-driven innovation in Edinburgh. So over to you, Michael. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very uh, pleased to be to be part of this event today. And um, so uh, maybe I want to, just to give a bit of background around all the kinds of things we're doing in Edinburgh around uh, uh, art, science, uh, engaging with external uh, organizations to uh, drive new, interesting, innovative things. Uh, for the benefit of society and the economy. So um, for those of you who are not aware of the Data-Driven Innovation Program, this is part of our uh, local Edinburgh City and Southeast Scotland uh, region deal, which is a 1.3 billion investment uh, in economic development. And about half of this um, funding will go into a Data-Driven Innovation Program, which really has a, has a very ambitious play, uh, um, uh, aim, which is to drive the local and regional economy through the use of data and, and help lots of different sectors grow. Uh, one of these sectors is uh, our creative industries. So um, we've, we've created, we, we've designed the program around sectors that could benefit from the use of data and design informatics, creative informatics and several other initiatives in space and so on are very, very core to this wider ambition to bring in people from all different sectors and organizations together to uh, understand how data, uh, technology, AI, and, and all these amazing new things can really benefit all these um, uh, sectors of the economy and the wider community and uh, ultimately our citizens. Um, so the base center um, sits kind of at the science and engineering end of that equation. So it's one of the five innovation hubs that are being created. The Edinburgh Futures Institute that's been mentioned being another one, sitting more in the arts, humanities, um, um, social sciences, 
uh, end of the spectrum. And uh, design informatics has been a, an initiative that started a long time ago between informatics and the art college, and that has been instrumental to bring the creatives, the artists, the designers um, uh, together with the technologists. And uh, everybody thought initially that that was a wacky idea, uh, but it turns out it's been extremely successful and it's led to, to um, the Institute for Design Informatics and, and big projects and collaborations across the university. And so uh, regarding uh, what, we're, what, what the event today is about, so one of the um, areas where we can use data is space and satellites that uh, Bayes is responsible for within this whole data-driven innovation program. Uh, and uh, I was certainly pretty, same as Dave, not aware of you know, how many things space and satellite data can be used for. for so anything from climate prediction, weather monitoring, um, predicting uh, natural catastrophes, uh, food security, all the way, all the way to, of course, you know, tracking our, our biosphere and, and the environment and all the creatures and plants uh, that live in it. And uh, so the puffin, I think, is a, is a good example that is both kind of uh, regional and uh, close to the Scottish uh, geography and tradition and history. Um, but also, uh, it, this is about understanding how society will actually deal with data in the longer term. And I think it's the one of the big contributions is, that uh, I think art and creative people can make is to bring us closer to the future world that will arise from the use of data and advanced data technology. And uh, in, in some ways you may think, you know, art and, and, and hard science, those are kind of different, different things. But um, I, I quite like this uh, definition of art that says art is uh, uh, expression through a medium that resists you. And, and in a sense, uh, maths and technology and bits and bytes and, and computers uh, and sensors and satellites are also media that resist you. And you still want to express your ideas through them. So in fact, I don't actually think um, art and science are not that different. They rely on uh, mainly people and ideas and creativity and, and solving problems and, and communicating with others. Um, so I think the, uh, the uh, work we're going to hear about today is a great example for uh, what we're trying to do here. So uh, we, we're working across the disciplines, we're working across sectors, we're bringing in external organizations because this is where the, uh, this is where the challenges come from that we have to solve, you know, whether it's uh, um, the conservation of, of species in the natural environment or whether it is... Um, you know, sending, sending people to Mars with these satellites uh, so they can uh, maybe escape a dying Earth in a hopefully in a, in a future that will not materialize. I'm, I'm, I'm still hopeful that won't happen. Uh, and so, and so um, when technologists work with data, they think of quantifiable outcomes. They think of, you know, how can we make predictions? How we, can we analyze behaviors? And how can we see what's happening in the real world through the through the um, lens of data. Uh, but I, I, I presume what, what Elaine will talk about uh, today is uh, how we can uh, use uh, creative modes of expression to, to explore what's in the data. And sometimes that is a step that precedes um, the deeper understanding uh, that can be quantified and ter be turned into a hard science. But equally, it's also very important in terms of reflecting on technology and the impact it's having on us and our perception on the world. Uh, and then Connie, I'm sure, will, will, will give us uh, uh, the insight that is kind of less, less academic, but comes more from the people who are actually concerned about the world and, uh, and, and what's going on with the climate and with different species and with the protection of the, of the habitats of these animals. And I think, um, so it's a, it's a great illustration of that triangle between uh, what we academics often call the real world outside of a university, um, and then uh, how the arts, sciences, and, and the um, uh, different sectors out there in society and different communities can all benefit by working together in this area. So um, uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about this work, and I'm uh, very happy we're continuing this collaboration uh, through these residencies to really expose uh, people uh, to each other when they sit on different sides of, of various um, 
uh, well, you might call them fences, but I actually think they're more kind of um, little steps where you just have to, that you just have to take to cross over. And uh, yeah, so uh, very much looking forward to today's session. And with that, I'll hand back to Dave um, as the MC of the session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, it's great to get everything into that very grand uh, perspective about the possibilities of, or lack of uh, human existence. Um, so it's, it's good to feel we're doing something significant. Um, so one or two pieces of housekeeping that I forgot to mention at the beginning. Firstly, we are recording this session um, and that includes the chat. We don't do much with the chat, but um, we are keeping the videos so we can use them uh, in the future. And the other is that we very much encourage questions and Q&A. And if you put them into the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your uh, Zoom, just to the right of that little bar of icons, there's a Q&A with some speech bubbles. If you put them in there, we'll try and make sure they get asked. And you can either um, rely on me to ask them, or preferably, if you've got a microphone and you're happy to ask your question live on air, we would much rather hear questions in your voice and we can give you the microphone, the virtual microphone, uh, so you can ask your question as and when. Um, so we'll have uh, two talks now and we'll have a little bit of time for questions after Elaine's, but then I think we'll save most of the chat until uh, both Elaine and Connie have had a chance to speak, um, just because then we can ask the interesting questions that go across art and science at the same time. Uh, so next up we've got Elaine Ford, who's one of our artists in residence. Uh, she's a multidisciplinary artist uh, using glass sculpture, installation and painting. Uh, she's got a master's in tropical biology and also a BA in fine art and uh, digital crafting in glass from Edinburgh. Um, and she really explores the interplay between science, technological in in innovation, excuse me, uh, biodiversity, conservation and adventure. Um, and she's got lots of other interesting projects on the go, like using 360 degree filmmaking uh, to engage diverse communities around conservation issues. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what she's been getting up to. So over to you, Elaine. Hi, thanks very much, Steve. Yep, so I'm, I'm Elaine, um, I'm a visual artist and biologist, um, and it's been fantastic working with this residency. We've been able to collaborate with scientists and experts and also with finding new ways of art making and processes during lockdown where my home's become my studio. So I'm just going to share uh, my screen with you, got a wee presentation. Okay, so here we are. Um, I've always loved um, working with science, working in the arts, and in this residency, um, fusing them together to work and look at exploring the power of satellite technology for preserving wildlife and habitats. So I'm going to go through this talk and kind of show a little bit about the experiments I've been working in and from the, from the beginning, from the sort of research side of things. So. All right, so collaboration. So the people I've been working with, Royal Society of Protection of Birds, looking at GPS data um, and also getting some really valuable puffin behavior support, which you'll hear more about later. And this data was also part, part funded from the National Lottery Fund. Um, and then I've been working with data visualizations with space intelligence and re-interactive, which we'll have a look at as well. So just a little bit about the methods and processes. I started really just thinking about movement of animals and birds in particular, um, because they're one of the most well-studied animals um, and they can also be used as environmental indicators. So I was really just like looking at drawing this and also looking at topography, the, the land that the, the birds are flying over um, as well as the seas. And I was really interested in looking at different academic papers and became really inspired by this author, David Abram. He writes about perception and language in a more than human world and really goes into like a capacities for understanding the outer world of nature and its ability to awaken our inner sensuous world. So really just about um, we are a part of nature and not separate from it. 
Okay, so the data sets I was looking at, um, looking at GPS, which is fully enabled by satellite data, and then also looking at uh, Earth observational data, um, which is radar images, bathymetry, and sea temperature. There was a range of other data I looked at as well to complement that, looking at the World Database of Protected Areas um, and academic papers as well. So, really the first kind of thing when I first received the data from RSVB, I was like, okay, I've got a big spreadsheet. I really need to like start thinking about like, how can I get this down visually really quickly? So I um, started giving it some context using QGIS, looking at uh, four puffin colonies all together with around a hundred puffins tagged, which seemed huge to me, um, so many. And it was in the uh, four, four islands in the Shetland Islands and one near North Uist in the Fair Isle, Fowler, Hermaness and Shantz. So basically I looked at plotting these four colonies um, with your X and Y, your latitude and longitude and like thinking about dots and lines, then thinking about the speed and the distance and the altitude because all this data is around um, puffin breeding season. So the puffins are traveling uh, quite far where there's fish or sometimes close to the fish nearby to bring back for their young. So then I looked at putting the data into Google Earth, which really gives the context of the yellow points are where the, the GPS of the puffins. So it's like a still moment in time where you can see the, the puffins over the island. And here is, a, to give it some more context, the data. So that's allowing us to see the world from space. Um, and one of the things that surprised me most when looking at the data was the amount of time that puffins spend in the ocean. Um, puffins are also, populations are declining and their biggest risks are climate change and overfishing is also a threat. But it's really interesting to be able to see this GPS data and air observation imagery because it can really provide these like, new dimensions to help understand the, the living earth um, and giving us a kind of changing our perspectives of the natural world in its dynamics. Okay, so this is the bathymetry um, of the seabed. You can kind of, you can probably see Scotland here in the outline and the Shetland Islands around where we're looking at the, the, the puffin movement. So what, what ama is amazing about this is that we often see the sea as kind of like uniform, like a, a layer of skin that we don't see past the sea surface to the ocean experience underneath. And there's so much information within the seas that we, we can't sense, which animals like puffins, they see so much more and sense so much more than, than we can. So I was really interested in looking at, oh, what more information can we get from, from the ocean? Um, and I was fascinated by how the, the change in, in land um, is what makes the sea salty, so the, the mineral from the land, um, from the rain to the dissolving rocks and then extracting the contained minerals back to the ocean. So this like kind of inexorable physical process was really interesting. So I downloaded this data from um, Gecko. So um, whilst I was looking at um, the, the idea of a puffin reading the ocean. It got me interested about, well, how is it that puffins can find their way back to the breeding grounds? Um, what's really interesting is puffins, once they're born, they, um, they go off and they fledge, they leave for about two to three years, and then they return to their nesting, their nesting site. And so how, do they, how do they do that? How do they find that? So I've got images of bathymetry here, and then the sea ocean temperature as well as the idea of being able to read the stars um, to get back to their home place, their birthplace. Uh, it's thought that puffins make mental maps of the birthplace, but it's still unknown and we're still learning a lot about their migration. Um, so I, I, I sort of started thinking, oh, how can, how can the ocean be read? Does, does the ocean have a memory? It's building up these layers of salts of sediment. And then I started looking at being able to extract the GPS points um, and the bathymetry data together. So this is an, an image or image put together, rotated around of the extracted bathymetry points on the data. So we're seeing like depth of the ocean 
um, with the, the movement of the animals in a moment, in, on a captured moment in time. So I also looked at how this would look more in kind of like 2D ways. Um, I, I separated, there were, they were 100 birds, so separated the birds um, and their multiple trips in a day, um, just created a wee animation here. And the color is represented by the darker color is the deeper the ocean. So the depth of the ocean is represented by color in, in both of these images. So this began kind of looking at puffin signatures. So I collaborated with Ray Interactive to look at um, what kind of visualizations does the movement of puffins make? What are the, what lines are they drawing? So here's the first one. And this is looking at the fair isle and it shows the, na the name of, I've, I've just put the names of the puffins in numerical to kind of handle the, the data there from RSPB, but it looks at the different um, birds and per trip. And the one to the right is an exploratory data visualization um, where the geographical coordinates are just started in favor of this spiral track um, and it represents distance. So white is sea level here as well. So every, every trick will end with a white because it comes back, comes back to home. So here's a piece that I collaborated with Space Intelligence to look at all the puffin data and their movement, all four colonies here. So I love this, it's like fireworks. And then I started thinking about the connection between the ocean, how much time puffins spend on the ocean, how um, the ocean is such a fragile and important ecosystem. Um, and started thinking about, well, what material can I bring out of that? Um, so I'm using these and experimenting with these data visualizations to inform and create these new layers of interpretation and sort of looking at these salt crystals, growing these salt crystals to re reflect the fragility of our ocean ecosystems. So this is one of the experiments, just looking over salt over a kind of like larger surface. So salt's like growing and the flight and the ocean and the air is this kind of like changeable dynamic motion. I started trying to create pathways to draw the, to draw with salt. So I've been using different techniques, different methods, different recipes. Um, different types of salts get different um, different feeling, but I really liked the sharp lines. Um, it really represented kind of how I saw some of the data in those visualizations. So I also started looking at bringing in other chemi other chemicals, other crystals to grow. I was really interested uh, with the idea of the chemical changes in, in the ocean and the art process, the art making of, of collecting these crystals and um, building recipes to grow um, because, because it's looking at the kind of like changes in the, the ocean is affected by what we put into the ocean and what we take out. This actually is a photograph of um, a crystal growing at the moment. So this is about three weeks it's taken, this crystal. Um, and it's, when I was undertaking this work, it was like really interesting to see these kind of like repeating patterns in the crystal formations. Um, and it also really looked like the patterns that I saw in the uh, digital elevation models. So like the bathymetry models and the topogra topography models as well. So it seems there's kind of like a fractal process at work in the art. So these are some, I was trying to, I brought out some crystals from the water and I was photographing it and kind of moving it and you get these really, really beautiful structures. So I love the idea of like encapsulating these forces um, and just playing with like notions of like time, memory, erosion and, and growth. 
And this is also against um, a glass blue backdrop and the crystals like literally crystallizing through the art making process, which is really interesting. So it's kind of like I've never worked with this material before. So it's been really interesting just exploring that. Um, and then it just working out with lighting. Um, or one of the future works I like to do is, is try the data visualizations projecting and moving light around. And I've been trying to experiment more with the, the control and molding and manipulating the growth through pathways inspired by the data. So looking at how I can connect it to the actual the shapes to see particular shapes of the puffin flights, like the puffin signatures, like the lines we saw before. It's quite interesting trying to control such a organic process as well. I love that it kind of looks like uh, layers of sediment over time. Except it's quite well, quite a short time. This is about three weeks as well, this, this crystal. And then I also was looking at um, the solution that I was using to make these crystals. And if I can draw with that and what that looks like after, over time as well. Um, so like the sort of textures that come out. Uh, this I thought kind of looked like an earth observational image as well. Uh, so it's really interesting to kind of like explore with these processes, the kind of like erosion and change in the landscape with these sort of abstract forms. And really interesting that they continue to grow, but then they also change. It's also impermanent. So when the crystal is brought out of, um, from its solution, it, it can be preserved for so long, but it will, um, it will evaporate. So it's kind of like the changing stage from the water solution to evaporating in the air. This is a close up of one of the um, one of the drawings. So um, for the exhibition, this is the uh, draft drawing of what I'm working towards for the final show. So I'm looking at these uh, crystal structures in strings, which are going to be installed in using the GPS data in in the areas where there's. GPS, I'll be installing a string and the string will uh, refer to the depth of the ocean. So using the bathymetry data in order to do that. And bathymetry data isn't fully satellite enabled. It feeds into a satellite model. But yeah, thank you very much. That's me. This is working in the home studio, continues experiments. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I love seeing uh, work in progress because you still have this question about exactly how it resolves and where it goes and you get to see some of the, the really in, the interesting steps on the way uh, as you're finding kind of effects and things that might happen and wondering where that's going to take you. Um, so I love the fact that we get a bit of a, a view into these, uh, these processes. Um, We've got one question that I might do quickly. Um, Zia, are you able to take a mic if we give you one? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, wonderful, loud and clear. Uh, yes, I've got a question for Elaine. Basically, uh, my name is Zia from Glasgow. I'm just wondering, wondering all the various data sources that she's referring to there. Is that something that potentially could be used ultimately to understand some of the potential changes to, into climate change, good or bad? Yes, definitely. Yeah, so um, when I spoke to RSPB, when I was looking at, um, initially I was looking at altitude data for the puffins, but then I started looking at um, the bathymetry data and they told me that uh, they actually use that to inform their habitat models. Um, and also understanding the movement of animals is important to understand change in the oceans that can be happening, especially for um, like say fish moving to different locations because of certain activities or because of rising temperatures. But Connie might be best to speak more on, on that part. Thank you. 
Fantastic. So I think that's probably a, a good uh, point to segue and uh, we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. So do please keep putting them in the question and answer box and we'll try and make sure we get to uh, all of them. Uh, so now I'm very happy to introduce Connie Tremlett, who um, has a PhD in the ecological and e economic importance of bats as pollinators in the tropics. Um, lots of experience with uh, field work and applied ecological <laughs> and is currently working in the seabird science team at the Royal Society for the Protection. So over to you, Connie. No, is it okay? But no, I, I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just a work in progress. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, okay. yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Now it's going to be 15 minutes. So thanks for having me to talk. It's been really brilliant seeing what Elaine's been doing with the puffin tracking data in getting that artistic perspective. I absolutely love the salt crystal work. Um, and now I'll tell you a bit about the project that generated the tracking data that Elaine's been working with, um, Project Puffin UK, which started in 2017 to help us better understand declines in puffin populations. So first of all about puffins. Puffins are small birds in the York family. They're much smaller than everyone expects them to be, standing at less than the height of a 30 centimetre ruler. We still don't really know that much about what they do in winter, but tracking data from recent years has shown that they spend it alone, moving about out at sea to different feeding grounds. The bright colours that we associate with puffins aren't there in the winter. They have this dull grey plumage that you can see in the picture here. In the past, people thought these birds were a different species, but now we know that lengthening daylight hours in spring causes them to undergo a transformation to the colourful birds that we know and love with increased hormone levels triggering the growth of the reproductive organs and turning the beaks, feet and legs bright orange. So the orange bills and legs signal to their mates that they're healthy and a good bird to mate with. The colour comes from carotenoid pigments in fish. So the brighter the colour, the better they are at fishing and therefore providing for a chick. Puffins live for around 20 years and mostly mate with the same bird each year and they raise just one chick each year. The chicks are called pufflings. They put lots of effort into caring for their pufflings, feeding them for around 40 days before fledging, trying to find really nutritious fish to feed them. When the pufflings fledge, they're immediately independent, so they have to be in a good condition to survive. So we don't know that much about what adult puffins eat because most of the diet data that we have consists of observations of what food they're bringing back for their chicks. The adults will probably eat any small fish, crustacean, squid or marine worm that they can catch. But the best thing to feed the chicks is small, energy rich shaling fish. Sand eels are the preferred prey in Britain, but sprats, herring and a range of juvenile fish in the cod family are also regular features in puffin diets. They can dive up to 60 metres to catch their prey, although most dives are less than 30 metres. They catch several fish at a time, which they wedge onto spines at the top of their bills with their tongue, once they've caught them, to allow them to, to continue fishing without losing what they've already got. They usually bring back between five and ten prey items, but they have been seen to bring back more than 50, which they always carry crosswise in the bill like this puffin here. Oh, um, well, I carry on with a few more facts about puffins to keep you entertained. I thought I'd play a clip that I took last year with a puffin fledging on the Isle of May, taking its first flight as an independent bird. Um, so the puffins work really hard to feed their chicks. They make over a thousand dives a day when feeding them and they spend over seven hours a day underwater. And if you've seen a puffin flying, you'll know how energetically costly that is for them. Their flight seems quite frantic with up to 400 wing flaps per minute. And then they use their wings underwater, catching fish through underwater pursuit flapping their wings to propel themselves through the water and steering with their feet. So 
Sand eels are a puffin superfood. They're a key prey species for many marine predators, including puffins, but also other seabirds such as kittiwakes and marine mammals such as dolphins. As the name suggests, sand eels need a sandy substrate. They bury into it at night and over winter and they lay their eggs on it. Sand eels have very precise requirements about the type of sand that they burrow in and the depth and the temperature of the water, so they aren't found everywhere. And sadly, puffin populations are not doing well. So the species is now red listed in the UK and it's classed as vulnerable to global extinction by the IUCN red list. That's the same level as, of threat as the giant panda. Puffin populations can be negatively impacted by overfishing, habitat loss, invasive predators and oil spills. But a key driver of declines is thought to be changing food availability related to climate change meaning that breeding adults are unable to find enough fish to feed their chicks, either in terms of quantity, quality, or both. Um, so for example, sand eels are impacted by climate change, both directly and indirectly. Um, higher temperature in winter increases the rate at which sand eels use up their stored energy reserves, and that affects how much energy they can allocate to reproduction, which in turn delays egg spawning and hatching times and causes a possible mismatch with their prey. And the types of food that are available for sand eels is also changing. So there's been a decline in their favorite prey, a species of cold water crustacean, which is being replaced by a warm water species that's less nutritious. And this reduces the growth and the survival of sand eels and results in fewer or smaller fish for seabirds to eat. However, we still don't have much data on puffin diet across the UK. There are some excellent long-term studies, but these focus on single colonies only, such as the Isle of May or Fair Isle. And we don't know how applicable these findings are to other colonies. So to help provide this important diet data, Project Puffin was launched in 2017, inviting people to become part of the Pufferazzi and submit photos that they had taken that year of puffins carrying food for their chicks. The, these photos were then analysed by a team of dedicated interns who identified, counted and measured the fish present in each photo. There was an amazing response with over 1400 photos of puffins submitted in 2017 from over 600 members of the Pufferazzi. And the quality of the photos that we received was excellent. 89% of submitted photos could be used for prey identification. Six interns did a fantastic job analysing the photos, identifying and measuring over 12,000 prey items carried by 1,350 puffins across 39 colonies. And this map shows the colonies where we had photos submitted from and the size of the puffin icon is proportionate to the number of photos. And this allowed Dr. Ellie Owen at the RSPB, who leads the project, to build a picture of how diet differs between puffin colonies around the UK. So this chart shows the location of the different colonies analysed, with pie charts representing the proportion in the diet of different prey items. So you can see that at Scoma and Scotcombe in Wales, over 80% of prey identified were adult sand eels, shown in light blue, which is a really nutritious and high energy food for the chicks. In northwestern Scotland, rockling, sprats and herring are also important parts of the diet. However, there appears to be a problem in the northern isles. Most of the sand eels brought back by puffins for their chicks here were larval sand eels, shown in dark blue, which are poor in energy compared to the adults. So also as part of Project Puffin, tracking data was collected from puffins at four different Scottish colonies, including Hermanness and Shetland and the Shants in the Outer Hebrides. So puffins were caught away from their burrows using mist nets, seen here in the left-hand photo. Then small GPS devices are attached to the birds that record and transmit location data. Receiver base stations are placed in the colony that then download the tracking data remotely whenever a tagged bird passes within range so you don't have to recatch the bird to get the data. 
After five days, the batteries on the tags run out and the adhesive used to attach the tags starts to wear away until the tags drop off. So this data then gives us really useful information about where birds go to forage and how long it takes them to find food. So it's too early to say yet what the tracking data shows us in depth as it hasn't been properly analysed, but there are some preliminary conclusions about diet that we can draw from combining this tracking data and the perforatsi data. So the tracking data show, showed huge differences in the distance that puffins from different colonies flew on their foraging trips. Here I'm showing tracks from Hermanus in Shetland and the Shants in the West. So birds from Shants are foraging quite locally, staying within the minch, whereas birds from Shetland are making much bigger journeys. One puffin from Shetland named Tammy, after the Shetland name for puffins, Tammy Nori, flew over 400 kilometres in one trip. That's the really long track shown in red there. And then if we look at the photos submitted by the Pufferazzi for these two colonies, they show that puffins in Shetland, which are the birds on the left, were bringing in much smaller fish compared to puffins in the shunts, which are the birds on the right. So despite all the extra work flying so much further to find prey for their chicks in Shetland, the puffins are only managing to bring back smaller, less nutritious fish. And the size data that we got from the photo shows this as well. The black circles in this map are proportionate to the size of the sand eels in the photos that we received. So you can see that the symbols are relatively large around Wales and southeastern Scotland, but they're very tiny in the Northern Isles, indicating that puffins were only finding very small sand eels here. So as the next step for Project Puffin, in 2017, the data generated by the Pufferazzi allowed the RSPB to build a really useful picture of how diet varied between Puffin colonies across the UK in that year. Um, but the next question is, how is the diet changing over time? So we've kind of got a snapshot and now we'd like to have a bit more of a context. So this will hopefully allow us to better understand how changes in things like ocean currents and sea temperatures and fisheries practices might have impacted on the food supply of puffins. So now we've got a slightly different request. We're asking for the Pufferazzi to submit photos of puffins carrying food from any year, so long as they know when and where the photo was taken. And we've had an amazing response so far, with to date over 3,000 photos submitted from over 50 colonies. Um, we'd really like more photos, particularly older ones, and submission is open until the end of August this year. If you do have any photos, you can submit them online through the Project Puffin website, or alternatively, if you have non-digital photos, we'd still love to use them. You could scan or photograph those cool photos that you might have, um, and then submit them through the website in the usual way or you can just get in touch with me and we'll see if we can arrange something else. Um, I just Thank you very much, Connie. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, and it was really nice to hear a bit of uh, the sound at the end. Uh, to me, this is one of the interesting things that's happened around lockdown is suddenly uh, there's a lot more possibility to record things uh, when all the cars and planes have stopped for a little while. Um, so we've got time for Q&A now. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we get questions for uh, both of our um, panelists. I'm, I'm going to kick off um, and abuse my uh, prerogative because uh, I'm really curious in the process of going from looking at data to having a sense of the things that are behind the data. And so I'm curious if either of you have uh, had a moment where you've kind of, you've seen those puffin trajectories and you suddenly have a sense of a single puff puffin flapping for 400 kilometers over the sea or a sense of you know returning home hungry or like how much of the behavior do you feel from looking at the data? Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm not sure really. That's quite a hard question. I don't. I, I know that that's a terrible thing to start. <laughs> um, I think Elaine, if you're talking, I you started were... talking, but I was still muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll get used to this one day. Um, yeah, I thought that, that was really interesting because when I saw the data, I was trying to. There was so much information. I was trying to pick out what is the most emotive, what is the most important, and um, coming from like a background not knowing much about puffins um, and uh, distance was one of the first things I thought oh that's really that's really interesting then I spoke to, to Connie about um, the distances that we're traveling and why and the colony size and if that's related um, and then Connie was explaining that oh, well it's uh, to do with distances or to do with how far they need to travel for food and um, so that's the links into the food availability but um, in terms of the flapping and the movement, that's something that I'd also really love to be able to um, try and bring into a sort of sculptural form. Um, I was looking at going back to when the studio was open for the crafting in glass, if it's possible to get that kind of like shape of a puff and flight and integrate that into the GPS data and make that into a 3D glass sculptural model. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, we're, we're we had a question from Victoria, who I'm hoping can turn up on the microphone and ask her question. Yes, I think I'm unmuted now. If you can, if you can hear me, we hear you loud and clear. Great. Okay. Um. So I, I just had sort of a two-part question, really, um, for Elaine. Um. One was, could you just say a little bit more about what? bathymetry is because I'm guessing it's this depth of the ocean thing but I wasn't sure how um, those images had been arrived at and then my second part of the question was really specifically about one of the data visualizations you showed where it was a spiral form which was really beautiful and I was I was fascinated to know was that just a quirk of the data that that's how it ended up being represented or was it that the flight of the puffin was actually literally flying in a in a spiral so bathymetry and spirals please <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay thanks Victoria um yes yeah, sorry I should have explained bathymetry data I just jumped right in there I'm um, learning all these new things about space data I get really excited about it <laughs> so bathymetry data is uh, the surface of the ocean um, much like topography data, but it shows the under the ocean. And then, so that's what it is. So it shows the depth of the ocean from the, the land. So that's your, your distance um, from depth from sea level. It builds up those layers. Um, and uh, the, your second question was uh, around um, the visualization. So the spiral, um, that was an integrated um, a form this, the puffins didn't move in that spiral way. They actually, it was, it was interesting to see them because they're quite, um, like they fly quite uh, erratically, quite jagged. And I was looking at ways to try and like smooth that out to think about making it like 3D and more sculptural. And I was looking at techniques that um, would allow me to do that. And then the spiral function is a function you can use um, and reinteract suggested that you could try this to see what it, what it would look like. And it, it does, um, it does show that kind of like, what would be portraying a kind of flight view, but that's not how the puffins actually fly. Thank you, that's brilliant. And I really, I thought the salt things are absolutely amazing and I think it's gonna be very beautiful. So thank you for that. Thank you. Lovely, we've got a, a kind of ecological question from Roy, if you're there and if we can give you the microphone. Let's see if this works. It's all, always a lottery seeing uh, whether things actually work. Uh, no, that hasn't quite worked. So I'll, I'll ask Roy's question. Um, so Roy is saying there's good evidence uh, from citizen science that dragonflies and butterflies are moving north into Scotland due to global warming. Uh, in particular, warmer early summer temperatures. Is there any similar evidence for changes to the geographical distribution of sand eels and or puffins? Yeah, it's a good question. So in terms of puffin movements, they've been kind of historically quite hard to keep track of because uh, there's just so many of them. And the only way really to do it is to ring, put 
unique rings on their legs, which would then you'd have to be able to recatch the birds to work out where they've gone. So it's kind of still not that well known how many of the juvenile birds from a colony will kind of emigrate out to different colonies and whether or not they'll be successful when they get there. And obviously part, part of that is, even if they do move, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will, there will be space in the new kind of, the colony that they move to, it doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be the available habitat there for them, um, or indeed the food. Um, the sand eels, again, have very specific habitat requirements. Um, because they need this particular depth of um, sea and the sandy substrate. So again, I'm not sure about whether or not they're able to move to follow their cold water prey or not. Um, but yes, I don't actually know. Okay, we've got one more from uh, Rosie. Uh, let's see if uh, this one works. Rosie, are you out there? I think so. Yep, um, I can hear you. Uh, it was it was just a sort of question to Elaine about how she sees uh, the value of uh, artistic visualization representation of scientific data uh, in terms of sort of education and awareness raising uh, about the kind of things that you're interested in. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I really love that um, art and interpretation of data allows us to kind of see things in a different way and explore um, movement and data in different materials that can be quite captivating, quite memorable, um, and that really serve to be like, um, like activism towards a particular environmental cause. And I find like art and science are, are very similar as well. What Michael spoke about earlier, that kind of like exploration and research and using them together can be really, really powerful. Thank you. Thanks. Great. We had a collection of questions from Mary. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, Mary's there and if we can give you um, a microphone. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, good. Hi, from Bristol. Two questions um, about the salt. Uh, what type of salt is it you're using to make the crystals? And what size are those crystals? It didn't have any dimensions on about that. So I'm experimenting, still experimenting with different recipes at the moment. Um, different, different recipes, different temperatures, different a lighting that I'm growing them in as well um, and the result can change if you depending on what what you're using um, in terms of like the size I am growing um, from quite small to quite tall um, it's limited to the containers and uh, what I'm using to grow it in but you can have them as big or as small as as you like so, really, so were you on that note, um, that's really interesting, you were talking about glass, would you present them in glass form as an exhibition piece or as a salt form? And if in salt, the atmosphere, the atmosphere around the sculpture might change? Yeah, that's what I really love about it. It's like impermanence and this the, the salt being the material coming from the ocean. And I, I love that it changes over time. And it's only a moment in time and then it, it, it changes um, that's why the materials I find like so magical to work with. Uh, I love that it that it does it does that. But I am looking at um, glass uh, sculptures to complement the work as well. Um, I am I'm looking at three um, D scanning of the crystals um, to give me something that I could try casting in, or I can do more digital sculpting with. I'm also looking at creating, um, like for the movement data buffers around the distances 
covered within a colony and looking at how I can bring that out as a, a glass sculpture as well. Does these materials, salt and glass, really, really um, show that kind of like fragility of the ocean ecosystems that make them so fascinating and beautiful to work with? And um, I, another question um, about the poets. I noticed you had poems. Um, which poets did you look at or are they your own poems? Um, not my own poems. I'd love to be able to write poetry, <laughs> but no, not mine. Um, so um, I was reading a collection of poems um, from a book, Drawing with Water. And I don't have the, I can't think of the author of that book right now. And it's got a full selection of poems, but I can write it in the chat later. Yeah, thank you. It's amazing. It really, really is amazing, but really inspirational. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Um, we've got a question from David now. Uh, hello there, thank you very much for a really interesting project. Um, and uh, I loved your presentations. I'm an enthusiastic member of the Pufferazzi so I have sent my uh, photographs in. Um, in your presentation, there was a tiny postage stamp size uh, graph, which appeared to show a million tons a year of sand deals um, being taken out of the North Sea. Um, is that right? And do we know where it goes? You know, is it going into pig feed and in fertilizer rather than going to feed uh, hungry pufflings? Yeah, so... There's a big sand eel fishery in the North Sea that's still active, um, which I think is mainly Danish boats. Um, and yeah, as you say, all of, well, most of those sand eels that are being fished are being used for things like fertilizer and animal feed. Okay, so uh, so Danish bacon is, is, <laughs> is where it's going rather than hungry pufflings. It's very interesting to see these kind of ecological webs coming out um, and sometimes somewhat upsetting. Um, we've got a question from Stacey, if we can give you the mic. Hi, thanks, Steve. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, Elaine, I was just wondering um, whether you think that c the lockdown has affected your artistic process in any way. Like, maybe it hasn't, but yeah, I was just wondering, I'm just kind of interested as one of the fellow artists to know, like, um, if you might have done things a little bit differently, if you'd had a bit more sort of freedom, or did it maybe didn't affect you at all? Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it definitely did. Um, um, because I would normally be in workshops and I'd be able to um, meet and talk with um, like you guys who are also doing the residency um, and it would be really, it was really different being a bit more isolated, a bit more um, thinking about what materials you can use, the space you can build in, uh, what's available to you in, in, the, in your house. Um, so I think that's definitely impacted the way that I've created and um, maybe even led to why um, I've also been working with the salt crystals as well as a part of like thinking about um, being inside and what what you can what you can do. Um, but yeah, how how have you found it? Yeah, I don't know. If, oh, um, yeah, I think I think really quite similar in a way. Like um, I think my process has been more disrupted. Like it's not as linear as it would normally be, but actually it's been really fun like it's been a bit of a roller coaster it's like you know there's been a lot of activity in the last week um and we've kind of uncovered a lot of things that are really useful so it's just been a bit of a wild ride really <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely right we, we've got time for just a couple more i'm going to see if we can go to patricia um let's see if if this works Patricia, are you out there? It feels like a seance sometimes, uh, <laughs> seeing if we can get disembodied voices coming in. Um, so, okay, Patricia had two questions. One was um, to Connie, it's interesting to hear that the puffins are as endangered as pandas. Uh, can you un unpick that a bit? Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, yeah. so that's the IUCN red list has different categories of threat that they'll class each species as, which range from kind of the least concern to uh, critically endangered, I think is the highest level of threat. Um, so puffins and giant pandas are both classed as vulnerable to global extinction. So there are various reasons that species can be put in those threat levels. Um, so it could be that they might have a large population, but the population is declining, or it might be that they have a very small population. And so it's quite vulnerable to any losses within that population, even if the declines are less uh, severe. Fantastic, thanks. And uh, the other half of Patricia's question was to Elaine. Um, is the fragility something that you're particularly trying to pick out through the delicate salt crystals hanging by a thread? Yeah, definitely, yeah. So it's looking at the, the fragile um, material reflecting the fragility of our ocean ecosystems and our ocean health and the importance is to, to look after that, to monitor it, and that satellite data enables us to be able to better do that. Um, so that was something I really wanted to pull out from the from the pro project. Yeah. Great. I've got one more from Chris. So we'll see if uh, Chris appears. Um, hey, yeah. Chris. Otherwise, I can ask. Uh, so Chris wants to know if there's a similar project like this in Iceland. Uh, which has had puffin breeding failure for years and it would be interesting to see uh, to compare the changes there with here. It would be really interesting and that's something that we've talked about in the last month of that that would be a really 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 great um, way to expand the project um, potentially in the future. There is in in Norway there's um, also a project that's using photos to look at the puffin diet um, but not to quite the same scale as this RSPB one I don't think but yeah expanding it out to other places in the northeast Atlantic and getting a really kind of nice coherent map of what's happening all over the range would be really great. And, and a very quick pragmatic one from uh, Charles uh, do you do you get the trackers back? Do they float? Do they sink to the bottom of the sea when I guess when they drop off the puffins? Yeah, who knows <laughs> where they end up? We don't get them back. Yeah, they just they, uh, they're specially made so that, I mean, they're specially put on so that they'll fall off within a, a, a yeah a certain amount of time. Okay, um, we're five minutes over, so that's probably a good time to wrap up the Q&A. Um, I just want to say thank you very much again to all of our speakers, to Connie, to Elaine, and to Michael. Um, it's been great to see all this wonderful stuff happening around puffins and data at the same time. Um, that makes for a very delicious end to a Thursday afternoon. Um, thanks very much for that. Uh, we will be back again at the same time next week um, where Victoria Evans will be talking about sonifying the movement of satellites in various ways. So that should be an interesting one visually and acoustically. Um, and I hope to see as many of you as possible there. Thanks very much. <laughs>